Welcome to Money Talks. I'm Genevieve Westcott with the latest financial news from across New Zealand and around the globe. In this edition, the world's biggest economy steps back from the brink. So why aren't they celebrating in the U.S. or anywhere else in the world? Trade Minister Tim Grosser pulls it off as Europe says yes to higher quotas for grain-fed New Zealand beef. And Fonterra's off the hook. The Commerce Commission says no to a price control inquiry into domestic milk markets. All this and much, much more coming up. But let's turn now to the most up-to-date market and commodity information. And it's all about the U.S. economy, even though American politicians did the deal to raise the debt ceiling at the 11th hour on Monday. Joining us now is ASB rural economist James Shortle. James, uh, you were watching Washington like the rest of the world. Oh, it's pretty hard to get away from it, isn't it, really? There's been so much happening and, and it's had such a big impact on you know, everything around the world, the currency markets, equity markets, commodity markets. So, um, you know, it's been quite critical the last couple of days. How has it affected the world markets now, looking back over the last week? Well, markets have virtually um, tanked almost you know, every day. So uh, here locally and regionally, we did see a bit of a pickup on Monday um, as we start to hear some news that we might be getting some resolution. But realistically, markets have been well down. And today, over the past 24 hours, in U.S. markets in particular have just been smashed. Now, the U.S. debt situation has uh, uh, just steamrolled over other vital uh, market information coming out of the U.S. Uh, tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, things are pretty ugly out of the U.S. right now. Uh, last week we had uh, GDP numbers talking about their economic growth, and that was much weaker over the past quarter than what they were predicting, and also they revised um, previous quarter. So really what it, it says is that they had a deeper recession, their recovery has been much softer than we've been, than we've been picking. But then you look at uh, manufacturing data, that's been soft. Overnight we've seen consumer spending has also been uh, really weak. Um, so there's been some pretty big, pretty big issues in the U.S. economy is, you know, they're going, to, they're going to pull back from the U.S. economy, stop spending at a time when, they, uh, when they're really starting to suffer. It has been good for the Kiwi dollar. No complaints there. Well, Kiwi dollar has been lifting higher. Um, you know, I guess that's, that's, that's good for, for people that are importing, but not good for, for the exporters and I guess for farmers. So there's going to be some specific markets that are, that are going to be impacted there. Let's talk here at home now. Uh, global dairy trade auction came in overnight, still softening. Not good news. Well, no, it's not good news. I mean, it did soften a little bit, but only only a little bit. I think that's the key point. Um, you know, we, we've seen a decline over the over the past couple of auctions, and and but I'm not really that concerned about um, you know the falls we have seen. We saw a similar um, similar falls during 2010, and right now prices, you know, dairy commodity prices and in, in US dollar terms at least uh, are still you know around 50 percent higher than what they were sort of at similar times last year. So, you know, not not too concerned just yet. A uh, big question, of course. That Farmers want to know is it going to affect their payout? You know, I'm not I'm not picking that the, that the payout's going to be where it was last year, but around that seven dollars in the hand for farmers, probably still looking about right. And the beef market, of course, continues to look uncertain. Uh, what's the latest there, James? Yeah, I mean, uh, probably if we went back four months ago, then I was pretty positive about uh, about the outlook for beef, and I'm still positive about the outlook, but probably over a two to three year time frame because there is going to be some short term impacts, particularly over the next couple of months. Um, when you, we look at our big market being the U.S. You know, they've, uh, they've got big droughts, um, more supply coming to the market. You know, less Americans wanting to get out on their on their barbecues at 40 it's degrees Celsius. It's too hot. It's, it's too hard. <laughs> Who wants to be over a grill? That's right. Out on, out on the deck, it's just, you know, they want to be uh, inside in the air conditioning. So, you know, there's a whole lot of factors that I think is going to impact on the U.S. market. And that means uh, potentially uh, lower schedule prices here at home. And how is lambing doing? I mean, we don't have any of the freak storms that we had uh, in early spring last year. That's got to be good news. Well, I mean, we're only just starting to get into uh, into uh, into that side of things. You're such so. a pacifist. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, I think the good thing is across the board here at home. Um, I've heard uh, you know people asking about production. We've had a we've had a pretty good end uh, into the, the past season. Good, good autumn, so a lot of people came in with a lot of pasture, and uh, there's going to going to be coming into the springtime uh, with in, in pretty good shape so we, we, we're, we're shaping up to have a pretty good year. Excellent thanks James. Coming up after the break the USA has gone right to the wire and avoided that unprecedented default so the soldiers in Afghanistan will now get their pay but the world is asking is a credit downgrade on the cards and will the Americans continue to print money? Europe wants more of our grain-fed beef could it be a boom for our meat and grain growers? Question, how will we convince Europeans to buy more from New Zealand? Don't go away. Ponder this in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. 
How much will the proposed U.S. legislative package slice from federal spending over the next 10 years? The answer when we return. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, how much will the proposed U.S. legislative package slice from federal spending over the next 10 years? It'll slash more than two trillion U.S. dollars from federal spending over the decade. Joining us now is a man with his expert finger on the pulse of currency markets around the world, the head of Rankin Treasury Advisory, Derek Rankin. And Derek, uh, the deal went to a vote in the Senate this morning, our time, uh, and they did it. They did it finally, yeah. And it wasn't even a close vote. It was like something like 74 to 21. What have they actually done? They've actually agreed to borrow more money and they've promised to try and save money in the future. You know, I mean, politicians, I'm sorry, but you know, a lot of the actual tax cuts they're talking about are actually increases that they're not going to do. Yeah, yeah. So it's all mirrors. And uh, I don't think the market is confident uh, of any of it. And a downgrade is looming. What are you picking uh, the market's reaction now over the next few days? Uh, the crisis apparently has been averted. Oh, I don't think anything's gone away. The sovereign debt crisis is, a, is actually a global issue, but it's more predominantly an issue for the United States and for Europe. We're still seeing Italy and, and Spanish bonds uh, rising. Uh, the sovereign debt hasn't gone away in Europe. It, it won't go away in America either. And the growth numbers we're seeing around the world, you know, the world's slowing. So share markets are starting to get impacted and it's not over yet. Okay, let's talk about the credit rating. Uh, is it going to go down? What are you picking, James? Well, put it this way, Standard & Poor's wanted more than what uh, they've committed to, <laughs> to, to, uh, to cut. And um, so who knows what they're going to come, come to, but there's probably, I think there's a very, very strong chance that they are going to get their credit rating cut. So there was probably two issues here. One, they've got to raise the debt ceiling. Two, they have to cut enough to satisfy the credit ratings. And they've got one, but they haven't really got the other, in my opinion. Yeah, and, and we talked earlier with James about some of the uh, latest data coming out of the U.S. In terms of consumer spending, I mean, it's, it, it virtually ain't happening there. And, and it's, what, 70% of their economic activity? Derek, tell me more about that. Well, uh, well a, a lot of the problems are actually regulatory, I think. You know, like the, the politicians have been arguing and arguing and arguing for months and months and months. And so people are very uncertain and they're, they're very unsure about what's going to be the result of all this. So they're not spending. Consumer confidence is well down. And the GDP numbers out of the states the other day were actually grim. And we've got employment numbers later on this week, and they won't be pretty either. So what do we have to worry about here in New Zealand now in the coming, in the coming weeks as we watch the American situation unfold? Because there's going to be massive cuts in spending. Good luck with that. A lot of people think that, that that's actually uh, too hard to do. I mean, the problem with the American system, in actual fact, is that, is that they can't actually have an election. If this was happening in any other country where you had this gridlock, they'd actually have an election. You'd and call get, it and go to the polls. Yeah, they'd have a new mandate. And there's no, there's no provision in the Constitution of the United States to do that. So they just have to argue and argue and argue. And when you look at it, the last mandate that was given was to cut spending and not raise taxes. And the Republicans actually won significant ground in the midterm elections. Yeah, so I'm, it's like that didn't happen. And people are saying, well, no, you know, we're not going to do that. Well, you know, we've got elections looming in 2012, and I don't have a lot of confidence that they're going to do much to, to do it. They're going to borrow more and more money. They're now, they're, their debt levels, as we know, are 14 trillion US dollars. They're b borrowing an extra 1.4 trillion US dollars a year, and they have to do those sorts of cuts just to not get any worse. And that's before you count the state debt and the pension funds. So they've got real problems. Meantime, uh, real problems as well over in Europe. Spain and Italy, uh, uh, it hasn't been contained. The, the, the Greek uh, debt uh, situation hasn't been contained at all, has it, in Europe? It's still continuing to spread. Well, what they're doing is they're actually hesitantly, slowly building the answer. And the answer is to create a European bond fund that can actually lend money to these countries as it's needed. And then they won't have to raise money themselves on the open markets. The problem is that the fund is there and it's now got the power to lend money to them, but it hasn't got any money. So it needs its firepower. It's like building a gun without any bullets. They actually need to put a lot more firepower into that fund. It needs to be a, a two trillion, two and a half trillion euro fund. And then the Chinese and the Japanese will actually have European bonds that they can invest in. 
and then we'll start seeing some some real real answers come through there. But meantime, uh, Moody's has put Spain on a possible downgrade, James. Oh, I mean, it's not not really surprising. Um, you know, there's so many issues that are going on, and there's so much risk aversion. You know, people pulling back from the market, we're concerned about where where it's going. So if we look back six weeks ago, I guess then. If all the focus was on Greece and the European countries. No one was really talking about the US, and the and the real concern was, well, if you know, you know we start looking at the US, start putting the the blowtorch on them, then what are we going to thrash out? And we've we've found out what we can, what uh, what's under the hood, I guess, and to see what's it ain't and, pretty. And it's, it's pretty scary. So, you know, you get that sort of you get that sort of issue, and you've got investors out there. The great the great uh, America is potentially could have defaulted on its on its debts, and and uh, you know they're going to be in a, on a slow grind over the next potentially 10 years or more, um, you know, that you look at other countries around the world, you know, it really puts into question everything. Even in China, uh, economic activity is slowing. Concerns there, Derek, uh, what are you hearing? Well, it's slowing, but, you know, hey, it's down to 9%, uh, you know, and the numbers that come out of China are incredibly debatable how accurate they actually are. You know, you talk to China experts and they'll tell you that a lot of the Chinese data is manufactured, so they don't really place a lot of credence on China numbers. I think the, the commodity story, the demand is, is still going to be there, particularly out of Asia, uh, and, and New Zealand's in a very good spot. And don't forget, we've got the World Cup looming, uh, and you look at that, there's going to be a lot of people in New Zealand, a lot of people all around the country, that are going to be spending. And we don't use traveller's checks anymore, so these people are all going to have credit cards, and as they're getting out their credit cards, you know, to pay for meals and pay for hotels and, and wine and, and all the entertainment, and not to mention the teams that are going to be here and all the support that they're going to need, there's going to be more demand for New Zealand dollars in September. So it's coming at the right time. We've really lucked out with this. Uh, yeah, well, I think the, the problem the problem for the tourists coming in is that the New Zealand dollar is so high, it makes everything expensive not, for yeah, them. Yeah, not, not quite as good as it used to be coming to visit. It, but it's still cheap. It's still relatively cheap for them. Yeah. Where would you be putting your money in the world right now? What, what, what currency should farmers be buying if they have a little extra under the mattress? I'd be buying New Zealand dollars. I'd be investing in New Zealand. I'd be investing in New Zealand dollars. And uh, second would be Australian dollars. Uh, and, and really, there's... There's not a lot of choice, I don't think. Gold hit an all-time high today. Would you be buying gold? Yeah, I'd still be buying gold. Uh, people are very mistrustful of governments printing money. And the big problem we've got in the United States is in all this, we haven't really heard from Mr Bernanke. And we've got growth falling over. If we've got unemployment numbers that are terrible this week, then the, 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 the prospect of QE3, where he starts to look at assisting the US economy by printing more money, may well come back again. James, printing more money hasn't worked in the past for them, uh, so why would they print more now? Well, I mean, I'd argue whether whether or not it's worked. I, I guess they've managed to spin the wheels, been able to spin the wheels. Um, we haven't we haven't seen an explosion of economic activity, that's for sure. But um, if they hadn't have done that, then okay. So best case scenario, worst case scenario over the next couple of years, what's going to happen to the world's biggest economy, Derek? I think we're going to get growth, but it's going to be very, very slow. Don't forget that corporate America is in, is in incredibly good shape. They're doing these, well. These companies are major companies around the world, and they've got significant money in the bank. They're cashed up. Their balance sheets are very strong. Google now has more money on deposit in, in short-term cash than the U.S. government. Wow. You know, that was a stat that came out the other day, and that's sort of like unbelievable. So you've now got corporate America in good shape, and you've got, you know, like if you like government America in very bad shape. And that's why the numbers look bad. When corporate America decides that things are uh, comfortable to begin investing and, and actually employing people again, then they'll start to take up that slack. But they're not prepared to do it yet, while everything still looks so uncertain in the debt the debt argument and the downgrades I guess, looming. I guess the question is, that depending on which companies are out there, I mean, if they're American companies, then yes, but uh, some of those companies, they've been doing well because they've got a... Multinationals and the US dollar is so weak <laughs> that when they actually bring their money back, then they, they look pretty. They look pretty sharp. So, are they going to be investing um, when they do to, to get pull out the checkbook to go and invest? Are they going to invest in America? Potentially not. They might be going to um, expanding economies, going to uh, the, the the Southeast Asian countries, the Chinese, the um, the African nations, the ones that are going to be exploding. I mean, if, that, if if I was looking to put in a dollar, then that's where I'd be going. So, um, I guess the question is around that. They are definitely in good shape, but where are they going to put their money? Interesting. In the states, they worry about: Are we going to be able to keep the house? Uh, are the banks going to foreclose? Am I going to have a job? Here, the big debate has been about the price of milk. And I see that the Commerce Commission now has come out and said, after four months' investigation, there's really not a lot we can say. It's not in our terms of reference. What's all this about? 
Well, yeah, I mean, uh, there's been people crying out for some sort of investigation here, and I guess when you when you looked if, if you were in, looking at the legal detail, then perhaps it's not in their their mandate to uh, to get involved in it. But um, when you've got a pub when you've got a public that really wants to know wants to, wants to have you know a bulletproof argument that uh, they're not getting ripped off, then potentially maybe we should should look into yeah, it. Yeah, in some dairies, yeah, it's it's costing you what to six dollars for two liters of milk. It's gone up nine over 9%, 9.5% in the past year. Derek, do you think we're paying too much for milk? There's a world price for milk, uh, and it's actually fairly transparent how that's actually done. And so I'm not sure that there's a hell of a lot to look at, really. At the end of the day, there's a, there's a price for milk in the world, and that translates into New Zealand dollars, and that's what we pay. Well, it's interesting. Uh, David Carter, the agriculture minister, was asked last night in a news scrum, do you think that New Zealanders are paying too much for milk? And he said, I don't know. Mm. What does that tell you? <laughs> yeah. Confused. And how much money have we paid those civil servants to investigate something that they really can't answer? I think I think a bigger issue there is I think I think Fonterra, for instance. I mean, it's interesting. The Australian Reserve Bank governor said the other day that Australians are benefiting out of their mineral boom because you can buy BHP shares, you can buy Rio Tinto shares. So if you want to share in the Australian, and a lot of their pension funds are big owners in the in the mining industry, you can't buy shares. That's right, unless in the you're milk a industry in New Zealand. Yeah, unless you're a farmer. Unless you're a farmer. So the benefits to New Zealand flow down through the farmers, and as they spend, it flows out into the wider economy. I think New Zealanders should be able to buy shares in Fonterra. And so I don't think they should have voting rights necessarily, but they should certainly share in some of the gains. What do you think, James? Would you agree with that? Well, I mean, putting it simply, I don't think farmers are ever going to give away control. And they've made it quite clear over previous years that they don't want to um, give away control of, the, you know, of, of Fonterra. I guess, um, you know... Uh, Milk is our is our mineral um, is our mineral mineral is, is the same as the Australian's mineral industry, but um, you know there is potential that you know Fonterra could accumulate more cash by get bringing in outside investors, still maintaining voting control for the farmers. Um, you know that, that there would be some benefits out of that to grow to grow the market to grow the New Zealand economy because it is our biggest export earner. It is a major part of our economy, and it would be great to see it bigger. It's interesting that Fonterra, with all of its uh, success, still hasn't won the hearts and minds of the people here at home. What does that tell you, Derek? Well, wouldn't you like in your pension fund to actually have shares in Fonterra? I don't care whether I don't have any voting rights. That's fair enough. But I'd like to share in the gains. And if I could own Fonterra shares for you know the next 10, 20, 30 years, why not? Why I mean, wouldn't New Zealand share in that? We are already seeing a lot of uh, invest overseas investment funds investing in dairy farms in New Zealand because they want to have exposure to the dairy industry, the protein story, the food story, um, mm -hmm. and they see New Zealand as being a safe uh, place to invest. So we're seeing more and more of that. Um, people can go out and there are investment vehicles out there for them to go and invest into, into dairy farms. It's just that the price of that is getting much, much higher. You, you need to have a, a decent wad of cash to be able to invest. You can't, you know, you can't just show up with your um, ice cream ice cream bin of cash, I guess, <laughs> to go into a farm. So that's the issue. That's the issue. Meantime, uh, uh, we're going to be selling more grain-fed beef to the EU. Trade Minister Tim Grosser has done the deal, and uh, uh, beef guys here are very excited. Uh, what's your take on it, James? I mean, it's it's an exciting story, but um, you know, it's uh, I guess it's going to be a, it's a small market. Um, it's going to be a small product mix. Something that we don't necessarily do a lot of here. Um, you know, we're a grass-fed beef sort of country, um, so. And maybe it's, it's going to give us an opening into a into a big uh, opening through the door. That's a big big market, so that might that might be something to get excited about. But um, you know, I, I'm not going to I'm not predict, predicting that we're going to see a massive explosion of uh, of grain fed beef in New Zealand over the next couple of years because of this deal. I guess you are such a pessimist. <laughs> Thanks, James and Derek. Stand by. Coming up after the break, future proof on the highways and byways of the economic world. Our experts tell us what they'll be tracking over the next seven days. But first, a question for you in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. How many liters of oil does it take to produce the corn that one cow eats? Find out after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, how many liters of oil does it take to produce the corn that one cow eats? 939 liters of oil grows enough corn to feed a single cow. And now it's time for Future Proof. What's coming up for our experts? And Derek, uh, there's some more uh, employment data coming out of the U.S. What are you picking? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's not going to be pretty. Whatever the numbers are, they won't be good. And the, the growth numbers in the United States um, were actually significantly downgraded recently. And all of the forecasts, everyone's downgrading their outlook. So the employment report is going to be grim, I think. And the interesting thing will be when does the Federal Reserve start to react to that? And when do they start uh, softening up the market? It, it's a high bar for them to actually begin more quantitative easing, more printing of money. But I, I think it's coming. And uh, the Aussie dollar continues to climb ever higher, uh, putting on your, you know, guru status. So what do you think is going to happen there? Uh, well, the Australian dollar, we have a target there, 116. Uh, currently, I think it's about 108 at the moment, and it's been as high as 110.50 recently. So it's, it's still going higher. Okay. So they, they had their Reserve Bank, the Reserve Bank in Australia, they um, released their, uh, the oversight of their cash rate yesterday and they, mm. they came out and they were a little bit, um, the markets interpreted it a little bit differently, to be honest. But um, the Australian economy's got their own issues. I was, I was across the Tasman just a couple of weeks ago and I mean, all the uh, corporates over there, the re retailers, they're all screaming and saying, you know, what the Woolworths, those sorts of things. Uh, the, the CEO was in the media saying, it's going to be a tough year. It's going to probably going to be you know, one of our toughest years. So. I think that that economy has sort of slipped off a little bit. Which um, is incredible because uh, with all of the mineral wealth they have in that country, what's gone wrong? Well, I guess you've got a two-speed, you know, two-speed two, mm. two speed, uh, Australian economy. You've got the, the, the um, mineral operators and the miners. They're doing extremely well. Anyone that's working in a mine is probably getting paid well. But, um, you know, you, you go walk down um, um, Sydney and that sort of thing, and, the, and it's, it's pretty tough. It's, yeah, they're, they're, they're striking a little bit more. What about the uh, Kiwi dollar? I know, Derek, uh, you're thinking it's going to hit 90. How soon? Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is that the, I mean, we had a forecast earlier on this year that we thought we'd, we'd hit 86 at some point. And uh, we've just redone that work and we're actually looking for 93 later on this year. Uh, the New Zealand dollar's in an upward, upward path and it's a, it's a long-term paradigm shift. It's actually, there's a lot of good news around the New Zealand economy. Uh, we're going to have a significant rebuild eventually start in, in, in the South Island. As I said, we've got the World Cup looming and the American economy has got some real issues. So. Unfortunately, the New Zealand dollar is going to keep climbing, uh, and that's that's a long term. It's a long term change, and people just have to get used to that. And same same for the Australian dollar. The Australian dollar is going to keep climbing as well. You know, I mean, the Reserve Bank is conscious in Australia that that, that they are slowing down in retail, but that's they, they knew that when they were raising interest rates that that was actually going to be an outcome. So, with the rising, rising, rising Kiwi dollar, how is that going to change how we interact with the rest of the world from a business point of view? Well, I mean, the, the, the main business model in New Zealand has been to import things from Asia, do something to it and sell it to Australia. And so, the, you know, you've got a lot of companies that actually do that. So that suits the importers in US dollars. As the exchange rate rises, you know, they get, they get cheaper inputs. Uh, the problem is the New Zealand Australian cross rate is now starting to rise. You know, we're over 80 again and we've got a target of 81 this year. So we've already come up a long way. But next year we could be heading up towards 88 because the problem is the Reserve Bank of New Zealand is going to start raising interest rates and the Reserve Bank of Australia, as James said, is just about done with their increases. So you're going to start to see that interest rate differential change again. I mean, it's, it's interesting for farmers. I mean, because traditionally, you know, we have been, uh, you know, push our product into the US, the European economies, the developed economies. But um, with the big issues that are around the world centering on those areas, then we have to start thinking about new places. And those new places are Asia and, um, you know, the developing new markets because, and the currency is not going to have such uh, as big an effect on those sorts of places. So, um, you know, we could see quite a big shift uh, in our exporting industries over the next, say, 10, 20 years. Speaking of Asia and markets, uh, there's a one woman uh, showstopper there a tennis player. Tell me about her. Yeah, well, I mean, if you look at uh, Lee Na, um, that's, the, that's, that's, her, that's her name. She's, you know, at the Australian Open finalist, uh, French Open. She won the French Open. And, and earlier on this year, I was, I was saying, you know, this is, this is going to be quite remarkable for tennis and her earning potential because, you know, coming from China, first woman, uh, first big tennis player on, a, on the international stage, her earning, earning powers is going to go through the roof into has. And, and apparently she's now, what, the second highest earning female athlete of all time. She's worth something like $42 million and counting. Over three years since she signed these these contracts, just, you know, one after the other. Um, and, you know, it's it's just quite unbelievable. And it, and it really shows the power of those markets and, um, you know, where, where things are going. You look at cricket and IPL, you know. <laughs> but all, cri <laughs> but all credit to her, though. You know, you look at her story, you know. I mean, I, I've watched her for a number of years and she has been a real battler for a long time. She's come second and third in a number of, of tournaments around the world. She's had a lot of health problems 
problems. And, uh, you know, she's had, uh, she's had all kinds of drama and she's actually come through and now taken out, you know, like a couple of major tournaments. Good luck to her. So there you go. Persistence. Stick with it. Believe mm -hmm. in yourself and keep going, guys. And strive for excellence. And strive for excellence. What's your point? What are you looking at me for? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks to my guests, ASB Rural Economist James Shortle and Derek Rankin of Rankin Treasury Advisory. We love to hear your feedback, so be sure to check out the website. Meantime, the only way out of the global mess we're in will come slowly, a step at a time, I suspect. As Dr. Seuss once wrote in his children's book, Yertle of the Turtle, I know James has read it, he said, I know up on top you are seeing great heights, but down at the bottom we too should have rights. Keep the faith. See you next time.